Hey everyone, Anthony Sequera here with Stormwind.com and today I'm going to do something a little dangerous. That's right. We are going to go ahead and look at a configuration that CCNA students are not responsible for. I repeat, you are not responsible for this configuration if you are a CCNA. A lot of my students in class were very interested in VPN technologies, and this was great because as you know, as a CCNA student, you are responsible for VPN technologies, but it's an overview of virtual private networking. But my students were so interested when we were talking about this, I promised them a video that would demonstrate a basic site-to-site -site VPN configuration and verification. Now, again, what you're about to see, you are not responsible for in an exam environment, but I want to show you just how easy it is to set up and just how fun it is and just how simple it is to do some verifications to make sure that your site-to-site -site VPN is working. So when we talk about a site-to-site -site VPN, we're going to talk about a couple of hosts here, and these hosts, host A and host B, are behind routers, R1 and R2. We can pretend that the internet is in the middle, and of course we're going to create a VPN tunnel between these routers to secure certain information that is going between the hosts. Now let me tell you a little bit about the setup so that you can emulate this yourself. Yeah, you can do this yourself. What I did was I used a router for host A and a router for host B and then routers, surprise, surprise, for R1 and R2. Let me show you my setup a little bit. There's nothing up my sleeves, folks, but I did pre-configure a little bit here so that I wouldn't bore you with the basics of this topology setup. If we look at host A here, for example, and do a show IP interface brief, we can see that I use the 10, 10, 10, 100 network for host A to connect to router one. And if you do a show IP route, you can see that I put in a default static route pointing to R1. So R1 is host A's default gateway to get to the rest of the world. Let's slide over and take a look at R1. R1 is configured with EIGRP so that it can learn of the remote host B network. So between R1 and R2, we're running EIGRP. Let's go over finally and take a look at host B. There's going to be no surprise there. If we do a show IP interface brief, we can see that I use the 10-20-20 network over on host B to make connectivity to router 2. And if we do a show IP route over there, you can see a simple static default route pointing to the R2 device in order to give host B connectivity to the rest of the world. All right, so just a simple configuration here. I'm using, once again, 10, 10, 10 over on the host A network, 10, 20, 20 over on the host B network, and I'm using 192, 1, 1 to simulate the internet here in this cloud. All right, excellent. Well, it's time to go in and configure a site-to-site -site VPN between R1 and R2 that'll be triggered by certain traffic flowing between host A and host B. Let's do it. So we're going to begin our configurations over on R1. Now you remember about these site-to-site -site VPNs. You remember that we're going to use that Ike protocol, the Internet Key Exchange protocol, to set up a secure channel, or what I called in class the cone of silence, if you want to think about get smart. So we're going to set up that management channel, if you will, so that they can negotiate and discuss how they're going to secure the actual data that is transferred back and forth. You remember that Ike is part of that ISACEMP suite. So the first thing that we do is we set up an ISACEMP policy here on the device. How are we going to set up this cone of silence? 
Well, we're going to go ahead and use pre-shared keying information. And for encryption, we'll use triple DES. We'll use Diffie-Hellman Group 2. We'll use MD5 for hashing. And we'll set up a lifetime on this of 86,400 seconds. I'm not in a real secure environment here, so I'll set these lifetimes really high so that this can persist without needing to be renegotiated. So there you go, folks. They're setting up the Ike Phase 1 information, as we discussed in our class. Now, I said that I'm going to do pre-shared keying, so I better set up the pre-shared key information that Isakemp will use. We'll put in a plain text password of Cisco here, which will be uh, hashed in the configuration, by the way. And the address of our peer is going to be 192.168.1.2. And let me just check the addressing here. Do show IP interface brief. Yep, that's the right addressing. Okay, great. So we have set up the pre-shared key for Isakemp that we're going to use with our partner. Now what we need to do is we need to indicate for the data itself, for the data itself that they're going to exchange, how is IPsec going to protect the traffic? We create what's called an IPsec transform set that dictates how we're going to protect that traffic. Watch this. We say crypto IPsec transform set. I'll call mine trans, and we're going to use ESP triple DES, and we're going to use EHP and SHA and HMAC for the integrity checking and all that good stuff. So notice, very similar to what we did with our ISACEMP policy, we are, with our IPsec policy, just dictating the particular protocols from our protection suite that we are going to use. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to create an extended access list that defines what traffic will be protected by the tunnel. Very important here. This is not an access list, as I'll prove to you, that dictates what can flow between these routers. No, no, no. This is what we call a crypto access list. This is going to define what traffic will be protected by the VPN. Anything that doesn't fall within this access list will be transferred, but it will not be protected by the VPN tunnel. Notice here, we're going to just, in a very lazy manner, say, all right, all of ICMP traffic will go ahead and encrypt in the tunnel. We obviously will do a ping to test, and ping will fall within the definition of that extended access control list. All right, it's time to tie all of these ingredients together in what we call a crypto map. And this crypto map is going to be assigned to an interface. So I'm creating one for IPsec and Isakemp. And it says, okay, this crypto map will not be enabled until you define at least who we're going to peer with. Well, we'll define that more. We'll say, look, if you match on the extended access list 100, please protect the traffic. You are going to be doing a VPN peering with 192.168.1.2. Let's go ahead and use Diffie-Hellman Group 2. Let's set a transform set of trans. We created that earlier. And let's set a security association lifetime uh, in seconds. Uh, let's see. Security association lifetime. We'll do it in seconds. And that will be 86,400. There you go. We tie all these ingredients together in a crypto map, and now we go to the appropriate interface facing R2, and we tie that crypto map to the interface with the crypto map command. Wonderful. Now notice what happens. 
Isakemp just transitioned to the on state. And Isakemp is ready to make that cone of silence with R2 and negotiate how IPsec will protect the data that we've defined to be protected in our extended access control list. Did I go too fast? Well, I apologize, but guess what? You get to see it again. Yeah, sure, we get to see the mirror image configuration on the R2 device. So let's go over there and let's do it. Here we go. First, Ike phase one. We do our ISACEMP policy. We set pre-shared keying for the authentication. We set the encryption to triple des. We set the Diffie-Hellman group to two. We set the hashing to, hmm, what did I set the hashing to over on the other device? Let's check. Remember, this stuff is going to need to match in order for them to uh, form their association. I set it to MD5. All right, good. Let me go back over to R2, set it to MD5 over here. Let's set that lifetime to 86400. And let's set our pre-shared keying information. Crypto, ISACEM, key. I'm going to put it in encrypted. That's why we put the zero there. And our peer address is 192.168.11. All right, excellent. Let's create our transform set. We say crypto, IPsec, transform set, my trans. And it'll be ESP triple des, and I did ESP SHA HMAC. We are going to exit that. We're going to create our extended access list that defines what is going to be protected in the tunnel. Uh, ICMP traffic from anywhere to anywhere. And our crypto map. As you might guess, you get real good at these with practice. There's a lot of steps, but if you break it down, it's not bad. We do Ike phase one, we do Ike phase two, and then we tie it all together in a crypto map after we defined our crypto ACL. Yeah, just break it down step by step. So here we go, crypto map, my map, uh, and this is an IPsec isacamp type situation we're configuring here. We'll match on the extended access list 100. We will go ahead and set our peer to 192.168.11. We will set the group. We will set the transform set we created, my trans. And we will set the security association lifetime in seconds. And we will go to the appropriate interface and tie the crypto map in. My map. And we will go ahead and note that Isakemp has clicked on, and we are ready to verify that all our site-to-site -site VPN work actually functions as we would want it to. What's our verification command? Well, there's two of them. You can verify Ike Phase 1, and you can verify Ike Phase 2. Let's verify Ike Phase 1. I'll do show crypto isacamp security association and there is nothing going on with ike phase 1 if i check ike phase 2 show crypto ipsec sa there is no packets being encrypted and there's no packets being decrypted there is nothing going on with ike phase 2 this is not a surprise, is it? Because in order to trigger the site-to-site -site VPN, we're going to need some of that ICMP traffic that we've defined to be encrypted. 
All right, let's try it. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over to host B. And on host B, we're going to do a ping all the way over to host A at 10, 10, 10, 100. That's host A. And I'll do a big repeat count on this, like 10,000 packets. And, uh-oh, we have a reachability problem. Oh, there we go. Oh, and guess what? The reachability problem was the tunnel being established. Oh my goodness, look at this. While the tunnel was being established, we were not able to reach that remote destination. Once the VPN tunnel got established, it looks like we're okay. Oh my goodness, this is amazing. Let's check uh, R2. And let's do that. Show Crypto Isocamp Security Association. And look, it did indeed set up that cone of silence to negotiate how the data would be protected with IPsec. And let's check out the IPsec essay. Oh my goodness, look at this. We are now encrypting and decrypting packets. Wow. So the VPN tunnel did establish itself and it did start protecting the traffic as we would want it to. Now let's prove something about that crypto access list and traffic being passed unencrypted. Let's test that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to the R, uh, excuse me, the host B device that's doing the ping and I'm going to stop the ping. Okay, the ping is now stopped. We're going to go over to the R2 device and we're going to rerun the show crypto IPsec SA and we're going to see we stopped at 553 packets encrypted. If I run it again, we see we're still at 553. Because I'm paranoid, I'll run it one more time. Yep, we stopped at 553 packets. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go to host B and we are going to telnet to host A. We telnet into host A. We go over to R2. We rerun the show crypto IPsec SA and we are still at 553 packets encrypted. So you see what happened here. Telnet was allowed to go through these R1 and R2 devices, no problem, and sure enough, it just wasn't protected by the tunnel. So we can see that crypto access list that was a key component of our configuration, it's just defining what gets protected by the tunnel. It is not restricting traffic to any particular traffic form. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed this presentation on creating the site-to-site -site VPN. And remember what I said, this was a little dangerous because I don't want CCNA students to be in a panic thinking that they have to have that configuration memorized like I have it for their certification exam environment. No, 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 not at all. We obviously need to know about VPNs conceptually in the exam environment, but we are not responsible for, at the CCNA routing and switching level, we're not responsible for the configurations. Well, thank you so much for joining me in this presentation where we took a look at the wonderful world of site-to-site -site VPNs and their configuration.